Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the uh, Ted Lasso panel uh, here at IndieWire. I'm Ben Travers, uh, IndieWire's deputy TV editor and TV critic, uh, and I'm joined by the wonderful David Rahm, who did the cinematography on the first season of Ted Lasso, as well as Paul Cripps, uh, the production designer. Thank you both for joining us today. How are you guys doing? Great. Thank you. Good to be here. Good. Very well. Good. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Uh, well, jumping right into it, I wanted to hear from both of you, just very basics right off the top. Um, how did you come on board the show? And David, we can start with you. Um, just it was there, were there conversations? Was there a pitch? Was it, uh, you know, somebody in particular coming to you with the idea? Like, how did you kind of get started with Ted Lasso? Well, quite a long time after Paul did, I can tell you that. Um, Paul, Paul got started already. I think they hadn't chosen a director yet. Uh, things were left as they often are quite quite late in the process so when they did I went through a sort of series of interviews uh, with producers with Jason uh, and then finally with the director when he came on uh, and we started together Tom and myself um, by then of course Paul I don't know how many months Paul you've been on already but um, he, he was well ahead of building everything yeah so Paul what uh, what was your story when did you get started and uh, what excited you about the project uh, well, I was contacted by a producer, the early producer on the show, Simon uh, Mosley, and uh, I had a very early um, Zoom call, well, Skype call with um, uh, Bill and Jason, and they were both on the call. And uh, I just really loved the script, and I, I kind of got the humour and... I just in, enjoyed it in that it was a world that I don't think many people see behind the scenes of, even though it's a kind of very uh, familiar world, the world of football. That that area behind the scenes is not something that's seen all the time. And I thought that was fascinating. Uh, plus the fact that it was a bit like The Office. So it was a comedy set in a workplace. It just happened to be a Premier League club. Uh, but the writing was so good in the, in the kind of pilot episode that I got early on. Um, so I was very keen to do it. And luckily, I think uh, in the kind of interview, I had a chat with Jason and we had kind of, we shared a, a kind of basis of when we first started, we both worked in live television. So there was a little bit of a link there, which I think uh, meant we started talking about similar, similar things. So I think that's probably why um, I ended up doing the show. Uh, so in terms of, in terms of like kind of, shaping the, the look of this early on. Um, were there any kind of uh, shows, movies, uh, any sort of touchstone or inspiration that you wanted to use to kind of, you know, form what it was going to look like, including the, you know, the, the NBC shorts and promos that technically originated this character? Like, did you look back at that at all? Did you try to distance from that? One of the issues I've had is what tackling was. There you go, tackling! What the hell? Is that? That's not a tackle. It's just sliding around. Soccer tackle, sir. All right there, Gary! That's how you tackle! Uh, no, I think they were the basis, and I think always the, the talk was about basing the whole show in reality, so that it actually felt real, and, and the comedy came from the script and the characters, rather than kind of parodying the world of football, we were actually trying to create a really realistic world, um, a believability of, of that this, the, this kind of comedy mismatch situation was happening in a real world. And David, what about you? Yeah, I guess by the time I got there, um, the everyone hadn't come over yet. And I was, Tom and myself were trying to sort of get to the grips of what, what the look uh, would be. And we looked at the original shorts that were made, um, clips and stuff. And the only thing that was really said was we don't want it to look like that. And we um, don't want it to look doco or too much like The Office, which was a sort of uh, a useful guide, but more about what they don't want it to look like. Um, at, when everyone came over, it became more clear that Jason very much wanted the show to take more of a, a drama comedy feel. And yeah. for me, inspirations were, were you know, there's a million films on football out there, but I kept on locking on to Moneyball, which nothing about football, but as a sports film, uh, it's a very filmic film uh, as a sports film goes. Um, and I think we, we kept on going back to that um, in different ways uh, throughout the shoot, really. Well, at, a, at a risk of misreading the, the camera work, it, it did seem like you favored longer lenses and a shallower depth of field than is typical for most comedies. 
Um, is, is that kind of the idea that you ended up bringing to, to the producers as since they were saying that they don't want certain things and you were like, well, what about us doing this? And then how did that kind of lend itself to the comedy of the show? I mean, it was very much, it didn't want to be a network style comedy. It didn't want to look too sitcom. So more and more uh, discussions I had with Jason, it sort of, it came out that it wanted to be film-like uh, and have that sort of aesthetic. Um, so I think we kept suggesting ideas and things that would sort of counter some of those um, tropes in some of those genres of, or sitcoms. So things like handheld um, started using it a bit and ended up using it nearly throughout. Things like the locker room, the idea was to be handheld, free, sort of Friday Night Lights style to sort of roam around and look about. And it's interesting you mentioned the um, long lens. Quite early on, we also pushed toward using the Alexa LF, which is a large format camera. It's got a very um, narrow depth of field um, by the size of the sensor. And it just meant that well, quite wide lenses had a na narrow depth of field. So I think it has that look, but in fact, the idea wasn't to use too long lens, but to, to shoot with quite a wide open stop and to use this camera, which gave us that look. Um, and it gave us that, with handheld, it gave us that feeling of sort of finding things, focus would find something and the camera would find something. I do love a locker room. Well, I, I wanted to ask about the locker room a little bit, Paul, because um, one of the things that, you know, obviously there's a lot that, that, you know, Americans may not be familiar with when you're, you know, setting a show in London and it's about, uh, you know, football and that's not American football. Um, and the locker rooms, you know, obviously in, in, in soccer over there, they change quite a bit and there there's, you know, a lot of variances in the size and the look and, and everything like that. So kind of what was your primary goal in designing or in designing the AFC Richmond locker room? Like what were kind of your objectives as well as, you know, some of the fun things you got to implement on your end? Um, I think the, uh, there's a kind of key relationship between Ted's office and the locker room. And that was, that was a big thing early on. So, you know, he wanted to be, to be able to look out at the, at the players and interact through, you know, a doorway and a window. So there was a kind of, kind of, kind of key relationships in the shapes. Um, and then we looked at a number of London-based football clubs. We went to Chelsea, we went to Fulham, we went to Spurs, uh, sorry, Tottenham Hotspur. And we, we looked at a number of dressing rooms and they're, they're all quite different, obviously, and different sizes, but they do have thematically some similarities. They, they're all very keen on using slogans and graphics and um, the, um, the lockers themselves are quite small. Uh, and, you know, they're only really used on match days. Um, so the spaces are quite pristine. I mean, the away locker rooms are interesting because they make them as uncomfortable and unrelaxing as they can for the away teams, which is uh, quite instructive about how they try and psych out the opposition because uh, one of them we went into even had urinals in the centre of the room, you know. I mean, it's... Oh, wow. But the home one is very, it's obviously driven partly by the comfort of the players, but also, you know, to do with, you know, a branding in a way. So I suppose the locker room took on elements of all those things. Uh, we also were shooting at Crystal Palace uh, Stadium, Selhurst Park. So we had to kind of fit in a little bit with, with Crystal Palace. So that, that became the theme of the kit in that it was red and blue because... Yeah we thought if we were going to shoot at Selhurst Park, all the seats are red and blue. So we thought if we incorporated the red and blue into our team colours when we created the kit and created the Richmond team, then obviously that would make it easier to, to blend in with the stadium we might be shooting at. Um, so a lot of the, the kind of colour scheme was led by practicalities in terms of matching various different locations when you build this world and uh, you know build the world of Richmond AFC. Well I actually wanted to ask about the colors as well because um, obviously the the scheme was so important and the red and blue you know played into the title cards and played into everything that you're talking about and, and knowing now that that was kind of a, a practical choice uh, is, is great but it it really is a show that to me you found a lot of ways to build little pops of color into the frames. And I thought that that really brightened up a show without it turning into one of those, you know, um, like typical network sitcoms where everything's just bright, bright, bright all the time and it's unnatural and the lighting kind of overshadows everything, uh, no pun intended. Um, what was it like kind of uh, looking for those and, and 
how did you know you weren't going to overdo it? How did you know, like when it was just kind of the right touch here and there uh, to add as much color as you did? And because it just, it just seemed to find its way into so much of the story. Uh, well, I, th I think, I think the world of football has that kind of color within it. A lot of the clubs, you know, the, the interiors are highly colored. Um, I think I probably, you know, I was running off the end of being too much. I mean, David's always trying to pull me back on color because I know he's always <laughs> yeah. down in the gray, in the gray. But, you know, I, I think there is something thematic about some of the uses of the color. And we tried to get them in like when we went to the gala, we used a lot of red because we thought we'd theme the gala. You know, it was partly to do, it was always run by the owners of the club and we thought we'd build it in, but we didn't want to exactly mimic the idea of, you know, the red and the blue, but I thought red, and when we chose a location that was a, you know, it's a predominantly red 1920s kind of ballroom, um, that really lent itself to thematically giving that whole event a kind of red feel. But I think that added to the ideas that were going on there, because there was a lot of simmering kind of tension in the scenes between the characters, and having that happen in a kind of slightly bizarre kind of red feel was, was an interesting kind of not accident but you know it's just it's just another layer that adds into the show really in terms of like the interior sets in in terms of this set like rebecca's rooms i wanted to make them quite stylish and keep the general colors fairly muted but then you get pops of colors with the paintings and stuff like that because i wanted it a little bit to be a a difference to what is below in the kind of training center which is quite brash and bright and clean and I wanted this to be a lot more kind of adult and and um, slightly more stylish, I suppose, in a way. And I think we carried colours through, right, David? I mean, there were pops here and there, and I think that's quite a nice thing to do. You know, I mean, when you get Keely, you get pops of pink and, you know, and uh, just little character kind of pops of colour, which I think is, is really nice. But I mean, some of the general colours of the set are quite muted, like Ted's apartment was quite muted and... The pub is quite dark and browns, but then when you get the, the scarves and the memorabilia, it really kind of pops it out. I mean, I don't know what David feels about that. Yeah, no, I loved it. And, and the way it went through uh, through everything, really. It was um, the one challenge we had was in the locker room where there was these big block colours of this bright colour and they were in their kits quite often, which also had a, quite a bit of bright colour. And it was just a bit sensory overload from where I wanted it. I also wanted the characters to stand out slightly. We had the whole team in there, all of them in their outfits. There was just blue and red sort of everywhere at that point. And we, we worked quite hard to sort of, um, it, only in that room really, just to try and tweak that color slightly, just just bring it back so that it didn't um, overshadow the players. But really that otherwise, that the color scheme, which Paul had worked out way before myself and the director had come on board, um, really was terrific and worked worked amazingly. I said maybe you're gonna be the one that saves me. I don't know. You're my wonder. Well, when it comes to um, some of the specifics within the show, I, I did want to ask Paul about the um, kind of the karaoke scene in the latter half of the season. Um, you've got this big, bright, intense LED wall kind of, you know, in the, in the background of the club right there. Um, what challenges or opportunities does that give you when you, when you have something like that that could really dominate the whole scene, uh, but it can also really play into the emotional crescendo of the narrative itself? That was quite an interesting day. And I think mm. it, it was also uh, probably not our greatest day in that it wasn't quite what Jason envis envisaged when he turned up. So there was a little bit of a kind of rushing around and, and, and trying to make it a bit more the, the, the feel that he had. But yeah, I mean, it's another intense kind of feel in that scene. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what you think about that. Did you shoot that? Day? You, you were there. Did, day. yes, yes. No, and I, and I really liked it in the sensory overload kind of way this cavernous sort of place with this room that I mean, we had full control over all four walls in there and the ceiling, I think. Um, and, you know, we tweaked it as per the performance that was going on. Um, I think, I think in the end, Jason was, was on board. It was just the whole uh, decor of the place initially that wasn't quite how, how he'd initially seen it. But I think actually it really helped in terms of, you know, adding to the fact that he was having a, a little bit of a personal breakdown in the scene. Yeah. 
I mean, not Jason. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it added a little bit to the oppressiveness of the situation that there was all this going on. There was singing. There was, you know, the guys were really hyped up. Uh, and I think the scenes that David did, I thought the handheld stuff through the corridors when he was trying to get out was really lovely um, in those kind of dark spaces and then coming outside to a bit more of a kind of calmer environment where he just, you know, Rebecca comes and helps him. I think, I think it all it kind of gelled together in a way that sometimes it does with locations that, you know, some of that is planned, but some of it is unplanned and all those things go into the mix, which is a really lovely thing because the actors feed off the, that, the feeling yeah. of how they are within the space, which is something which, which is always interesting in that kind of battle between whether you do things in the studio or whether you go to a location. I mean, all we knew was we didn't want it to be four walls, small space, a TV screen, uh, every, all these characters rammed into it, like a lot of the actual real karaoke rooms are, to be honest. Uh, yeah. they're, they're not normally as big as that. We had images of Lost in Translation, obviously with a big window overlooking, uh, overlooking the city and stuff, but they just weren't those kind of locations. So when we found that space and we saw what it could do, uh, it, it felt right. Well, that scene too, I mean, especially David, the way that you kind of shot it, because it's such an intense moment in a show that is, you know, it is honest and it is dramatic and it has, you know, a real tenderness to it. Um, but it's also very, you know, positive and joyous and exciting. Uh, and this is, you know, it's a really tough moment for, for Ted. How do you approach that knowing, you know, you have to balance that, like you have to honor kind of what he's going through and, and, uh, connect, the, connect to the audience in that way, but not go like so overblown dramatic that it disconnects from the reality of, of the rest of the show? No, that's a really good, good question because actually it was the one scene and moment where Jason really wanted to talk to me about it. Um, he, you know, I had some ideas from things like Rec Room for a Dream or Pi where we'd actually attach the camera to him and that would give him a sort of disconnected, uh, out of world experience. But he was very sure he wanted nothing like that. And it was very good to talk to him about it. He just felt that was too much and he didn't feel that was quite uh, where it wanted to be. And very quickly, I think we agreed, even though the location, there was complications about the location, but the style, um, the sort of, you know, natural claustrophobic feeling of some of those places not to be overlit and to have a sort of a journey within the space um, where he could sort of, you could see this sort of increasing panic reaction going on um, and sort of happen. So. Yeah, it, it worked I out. Think, it worked out incredibly well. Um, yeah, I think just, that's another thing about Jason really as well, because he, uh, if he trusts you, he gives you the leeway to do your job and, and, you know, create your own way and create things within yourself. But those particular moments that he's got a you know, he's got a real vision of because he's been thinking about this show for, you know, six or seven years, I think, before before it happened. So some of the things he's got, he's quite specific and he's very he's very good at kind of pointing out exactly what he wants. Um, but the rest of the time he will like, well, you know, you know better than me. You you do it, you know, and he, he will give you give you the space to be creative, which I think is a and he does it all with humor, which is great. And that's kind of that's kind of how I work as well. You know, it's slightly self-depreciating and, and a bit cheeky, you know, and he's, he's like that. And, and I think it's a really nice way to work. And I think, I yeah. think the look of the thing between um, myself and uh, John and, and David and um, Jackie costume designer and uh, Nikki makeup, I think it does really look filmic, you know, and it's the, 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 you know, David and John did a fantastic job in making it look really, you know, like a million dollar kind of film. It it just lifts it in terms of it's not a run of the mill comedy. It's not a drama as well, but it it's kind of like a hybrid that looks really beautiful as well at times, which I was really, really pleased with. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the aesthetic quality of, of the show is something that kind of goes um not under the radar, but really does help support it in the way that it's become known for. Like people really have responded to this in such a way that it's like, this is such, you know, it's so honest, it's so comforting, it's so um, uplifting. And, you know, it's not just, you know, the lines or the dialogue, like there's so much of what you guys have done to build that up, which I just loved. Um, but to steer off in, in a somewhat different direction, I did want to talk a little bit about 
the actual matches and kind of putting together, you know, uh, the stuff that's on the field, because, you know, to me, so many shows, so many movies, um, whether they're, you know, very specifically about what's going on on the field, or it's just a sports story that's kind of related to what's going on the field, they still live or die when they have to show it, like when they have to, you know, put these actors out there as athletes, or they have to create the, you know, the right um, space for them to work in and, and to capture that. Um, what were kind of the biggest challenges for cheating that that real, authentic, live sports feeling? And uh, I guess, David, let's start with you. That was something that evolved very much. I mean, um, there were so many limitations where we could shoot this, how we could shoot this. We started off thinking Crystal Palace, we'll just get on that pitch and, and there we go. Then we were told you can't even get a three foot close to that pitch. The pitch is their livelihood and the chance of us digging up the pitch and the ball bouncing in the wrong direction and them losing a goal, getting relegated uh, would be, you know, criminal. So we, it became challenging because particularly the games, the, the, the training stuff we could shoot on our own sort of pitch. But my idea from the beginning was to not shoot it exactly like a football game, to give it a different feel um, with references for things like Itonia, where rather than long lenses from the side, you had wide lenses and you were, on the ice with them, on the grass with the players. And we, we, we managed to get the sort of buggy, beach buggy, which was allowed on most of the pitches, um, big wheels, so it didn't dig anything up. And we used a Ronin camera, uh, or scout system, stabilizing system with our camera, which took out a lot of the bumps uh, and was remote controlled. So no one had to go, they just a grip. So that, that was sort of some of the more technical stuff. As we went on, we found certain places we couldn't shoot like that, we had to go on you know, thousand mil lenses from the sideline. I sort of went uh, block by block with another DP called John Serapio, and he had more of the football in his episodes. So that sort of idea I had from the beginning, he took through, uh, tried his best to keep that sort of alive. But in some of those football scenes where we couldn't touch the, uh, the ground, it was a problem. Most of the matches, including the final one, were shot on a, a field somewhere, not a real pitch. So we were allowed to shoot them like that. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a real hybrid of lots of different locations. And uh, we found in the end that we had to create our own football pitch uh, with with certain amount of green around it. Not not high green, but just occasionally to mask off players. Uh, and then Kip Kroger and his kind of post team created a whole CGI stadium, which replicated, um, you know, Nelson Road Stadium or kind of Selhurst Park. Nelson Road is what? Uh, FC Richmond's ground is called, but um, so it was a conglomeration of CGI scenes and then scenes we shot at Selhurst, scenes we shot at a kind of pitch we created, uh, and then scenes we shot here at Hazen Yedding, which is right next to the studio. So I'll give you a for instance for the shot where Ted runs up to talk to Rebecca to try and substitute Jamie Tart. Uh, the the bits with Jamie on the pitch was shot at the kind of the created uh, football pitch. And then we shot against a dugout. I built a dugout. So the coaches had a dugout with a few bits of crowd around them. So that was shot separately. Then Ted runs off and then he runs down against crowd at Selhurst Park, then starts to run up the stands. And then he runs up to a stand we we had at Hazen Yedding and I built the executive box for Rebecca. So that's like... That's a, a tiny sequence that involved like six different locations all stitched together. But once you create the kind of mind map of how it works and you get the little elements correct and they blend, it, it kind of seems to work. I, and they did a great job with the stadium as well, putting all the stuff in. So some we had some closer shots of crowd, which were shot at Selhurst Park and crowd reactions and then some of it is CGI crowd. So it's a big mix, but it, it kind of seems to work. I mean, I think there are a few elements where you'd say, okay, it's not quite, you know, real footage, but going between football footage in the pub that the crowd are watching and then stuff we're seeing for real, as if from Ted's perspective or looking at Ted reacting, I think all those kind of things work really well. Hoping it's easier this time, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> The, the plan was to make it a lot easier, but unfortunately the way that <laughs> yeah. happened, it never seems to work that way. Yeah. So it'd probably be more of the same. Well, uh, you mentioned kind of putting together um, the the mind map of, of how that sequence would play out, like the, the scene where he'd, he'd uh, be on the sideline and he'd run to the owner's box, then he'd come back to the pitch. 
you know, how much do you guys talk to each other to plan that stuff out to know exactly, you know, how much you have to build and then where you're going to shoot and, you know, who's kind of in charge of, of coordinating those efforts to make sure it all goes very smoothly? Because again, this is television. You don't have all the time in the world to get this stuff done. So like, what's that kind of process like? And, and you know, how much do you guys end up relying on each other? I suppose there's a, there's a fair bit of discussion, isn't there, with the, with the first AD and the director, um, you, we kind of break down each sequence into a schedule where we know certain bits have to be shot in certain places. So you start breaking that up and then you decide if those are the best places to do those shots. So I would say that that's kind of the process, isn't it, David? And then things change yeah. when the script change and you just slot bits in. Well, basically it's Paul telling me you can't go wider than that here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, sometimes it, it is because there's a, there's a limitation of what you can build and the size um, and practicality. So, and other times um, there's me pushing to, to try and uh, get a bit more space here, there, or, you know, and those conversations, they're, they're hard to have when you're working, but, you know, we met up regularly, um, daily probably, to, to voice problems and concerns we had. Well, we, we've talked a little bit about a few individual spaces and shots and scenes, um, but I wanted to ask, uh, like, let's let's start with Paul. What were some of the spaces that were, um, you know, either the easiest to set deck that we wouldn't really anticipate, that you didn't have to do as much work as it may have looked like it, like, like appeared on screen, or, you know, the exact opposite? Like, what were some of the trickier ones where you're like, this doesn't seem like it should have been that much work, kind of like the scene you just described? Um, but it ended up being quite an ordeal. Well, I I kind of imagined that at the start that the football was perhaps going to be the easier bit because we would just go to a stadium and shoot football and I'd be off doing something else that day. But um, I mean, that didn't really work out very well. Um, I think Selhurst Park was surprisingly, I, I, I thought I'd always have to go there and cover huge amounts of stuff and signage and all this kind of stuff. But actually I thought Selhurst Park was one of the easier places to, to film. And and David, I mean, on your end, was there was there anything yeah, that kind of well, stood out to you? Yeah, I get windows in a word. I mean, when I w first walked into that studio, there wasn't a single window. And as a DP, you know, you're looking for light sources. Um, you see, there's just textiles up in the ceiling, um, and you're thinking, how am I going to create some sort of atmosphere and contrast in here? So it, that was one of the sort of initially challenging things. And on the window theme, the actual uh, Rebecca's office location was um, studio built into a real location where the window had a southerly aspect, which is very difficult in the UK when you've got the sun coming in and out and blaring straight through those windows. And of course, as we got into the winter, we'd have like six or seven hour shooting time. So it was a nightmare for the ADs, that location. It was a nightmare for me. The sun would come out, we'd hit the green pitch, green light would but you know, belt up into that room. Um, you'd have to start sort of trying to neutralize that. Then immediately the sun would go in, you'd have to pull it all down again. All those days were some of the hardest days. As for the actual studio though, I, I actually got to love it. I loved that um, locker room in the end. Probably my favorite location with the geography of the office, the sort of frame within frames you could get within there. Um, the ceiling actually was very visual when you'd see it um, and all the players and the way they moved around the space that allowed for the camera to sort of just freewheel about the space as well with most of the lighting from from above um, gave the directors a lot of freedom too um, we, should, we should we should point out actually that you know like the gym the, the the locker room ted's office the kit room the trophy corridor the press room they're all it's like a composite set so you could actually spend the whole day just walking around shooting in it without cutting it, it really couldn't you david so they the idea I, the original idea was to kind of create a space where we could do a little bit of west wing kind of conversations that could because in the in the early pilot you know when ted first arrives there was a, a long walk through the club as Rebecca introduced the club and took him into the press room and he went straight into a press conference that he wasn't expecting. <clears throat> so the idea was to try and create spaces where you could do conversational walks and talks, because I think there is, uh, and more in the second series, there is a lot of that kind of people of having conversations as much as there is about the football. Yeah. So I think the idea was to kind of Keep, keep spaces where you could go down the corridor, but then also, you know, turn and go into another room and keep the conversation going. Um, and yeah, and and because of that, we had to 
restrict the amount of windows because we couldn't really have backings and have that amount of set. So that that's kind of the reason it ended up like that. But I think it I think David's right. It works, and it's you know it's one of my favourite spaces as well. Is the is the locker room because I think it it just intensifies the whole situation. No, that's great, and and I think again, like so many of these things, uh, even before we we started talking about the specifics, I think they stand out to people, and they've already become kind of you know. Uh, very recognized and appreciate, appreciated spots within the show. Um, and the last thing I wanted to ask before I let you guys go was just, um, obviously Ted Lasso has been a very big success and people are really watching it and they're having these very strong reactions to it. And just from from your point of view, uh, whether it's something specific that you worked on or you know just kind of your interpretation of the show as, as a whole, is there anything that you like attribute specifically to that kind of resonance? Like why are people responding as strongly as they are you know, other than you just made a really good show. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it blew my mind a bit, actually, because I really didn't know how well it would go down. I kind of thought perhaps um, perhaps in America more than here, particularly with uh, would the English swallow this as a fake team? And the whole idea of it wasn't quite realistic, which the Americans may not have picked up on. But it's so much not just about the football. Um so, yeah, I don't know, but I know talking about the locker room and all those people in the locker room and everyone, that camaraderie, I think it's something we're all missing, that feeling of being with people, around people, that maybe because of what's going on in the world at the minute, it's, it's, it's helped. Um, I'd like to think also the show is a great show as well as turned out, turned out great, but I think it's also managed to get a, a really good timing with something that feels genuinely nice um, and, yeah, something we missed perhaps. I think it's, I think mainly a success is due to the writing because I think there's so much heart in the writing and it, it's, it's funny, but it's also, you actually, it does actually really understand how people are and how they feel. And I think that really, really touches people. And I've worked on a couple of shows where, you know, you've, you've got fandoms created and things like that. And, and when people do lock onto a show, it's really important to them and, um, I think this one's incredibly important to some people, just merely because it gives an idea that, you know, people can be nice to each other, people can be good as well as bad, you know, and we can focus on people who are, you know, trying to do do something that's that's wholly, you know, remarkable and we should all be doing in a kind of way. Um, and I, I was really pleased because I heard that a lot of people uh, we're going to the pub in Richmond to they booked tables for dinner f- to watch the last <laughs> episode when it came out on the Friday. But that was really sweet because we the the ironic thing is we never actually shot on the interior of the pub in the real pub. I built the pub. We were originally supposed to shoot the pilot in the inside, but we didn't do it in the end. So I ended up building the pub. So they're sitting in the pub in what they think is the pub in the show, watching the, the pub <laughs> on on the show, which actually is a studio set. So it's it's really kind of, but that's a really sweet thing that they went to the location to watch the last episode. And it, it shows how people care about these kind of shows. Um, and if it makes you feel that good, I think that's just a brilliant thing. Yeah. And there's so many reasons it shouldn't have, because what does an American know about making a show about soccer? But it, it just yeah. goes to show if the writing is right. Um, yeah, yeah, the writing is so good. And it's, uh, I think it's also that's a testament to you. I think it's also a testament to your work, especially that people would want to go to the pub and and really want to spend time in that space. So uh, thank you both for making the time today. David, Paul, uh, excellent work. Ted Lasso is uh, streaming now on Apple TV Plus. So make sure you all check it out if you haven't already. And if you did, watch it again. Uh, Thanks again, guys, for joining us.